Well, we are uh, in 2 Kings, and I'll get you to the passage in a minute. You'll notice the title of the message, Passing the Baton. What we're going to be dealing with today is leadership change. And here's a quote. Uh, a lot of times I'll put a quote up and I'll ask my students, what's the problem with this quote? So here's our quote today from Kennedy. It says, a change is the law of life, and those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. Change is the law of life. What's wrong with that quote? What's the problem with that quote? Well, the problem with that quote, folks, for me is that it's true. <laughs> That's the problem with that quote for me because I'm the guy who doesn't own a cell phone. I don't change very uh, smoothly and quickly. I teach in a university, and up until about 10 years ago, you know, we kept our grades in a grade book. And when it came time to submit grades, we wrote them all down on this sheet, and we walked them over to the registrar. And then uh, all of a sudden, the uh, pinheads in, uh, in IT decided we want to put all this stuff online. And we started this classroom management software called Blackboard. And I had to learn how to do the grade center on Blackboard and all this kind of stuff. And uh, but I figured it out, and I was so proud of myself. Two years later, the pinheads in IT say, oh, we found a better one. We're switching all this out to Canvas. And so now we're using a totally different uh, classroom management deal, and it works great. But the learning curve is always, uh, always there. So I don't deal with change very well, but boy, are we ever going to be dealing with change here today? This is a time of profound transition in Israel's leadership. Arguably one of the most profound changes, transitions, since the death of Moses hundreds of years earlier. And what it is, is the end of Elijah's ministry, this great prophet who stood in the gap between false religion and standing for Yahweh, and he's going to be whisked off up into the presence of God, and his leadership is over. He's going to be gone, and the people are really struggling with how they're going to respond to all this. Those of you who've been around know kind of where we're at. We started last fall, actually, last fall. Look down here. We started way before that, 1050 B.C. But we started with Saul. We looked at David. We looked at Solomon, all these kings of Israel. And when we looked at the divided kingdom after things split in two, and uh, we spent a lot of time with this guy up here, Ahab. Several chapters, remember, at the end of 1 Kings dealt with Ahab. And then uh, we moved along into 2 Kings. We had Ahab. And then his son, Ahaziah, uh, not a real good guy. Brandon dealt with his demise last uh, Sunday. So we're done with Ahab. We're done with Ahaziah. And now we're, here's where we're at with this guy, Joram. And we're down around 850 uh, B.C., but we're not dealing with a king today. We're dealing with a prophet. So as I mentioned, this whole chapter, 2 Kings 2, is all about the end of Elijah's ministry. And I'll encourage you to tur turn there now. It's on page 307 in one of those OCF Bibles under the chair in front of you. 2 Kings chapter 2. We'll be reading a good chunk of text. But just to kind of set it up, I want to remind us about this dude, Elijah. This guy, uh, uh, I mean, he, was a, uh, he was a monumental spiritual giant, spiritual hero. Some of you guys who were here a few weeks ago, remember the big smackdown between him and the prophets of Baal? You know, they set up two altars, and Elijah called down fire from heaven that, to just smoke the offering to prove who was the true God. And then even last week, he calls down fire from heaven again. Remember Ahab's son, who's now king, uh, sends 50 dudes, two companies of 50, to kill Elijah because he doesn't like what Elijah has to say as a prophet. And in both cases, Elijah calls down fire from heaven, and it toasts these two groups of 50. And so his reputation was so big that 2,000 years later, when Jesus and his disciples are passing through this same area, Samaria, and the Samaritans won't let them by, what do James and John, they want to pull in Elijah, check it out. When James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to come in? fire to come down from heaven and consume them. Well, Jesus wasn't all about that. And he said, no, I'll take care of this myself. But you can see the reputation Elijah has 2,000 years later. He also had a reputation as a prayer warrior. He prayed it wouldn't rain, it didn't rain. He prayed it would rain, it started again. And later in the New Testament, when James is looking around under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for a model for prayer for you and I. Who does he pick? He picks Elijah. Elijah was a human being like us. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain for three years and six months. It did not rain upon the earth. 
And then finally, as if that's not enough to put Elijah at, you know, stage center of the spiritual heroes of the Old Testament, there's another story in the Gospels that really seals the case. Uh, this is a famous painting of this story. And uh, this thing right here is not a trampoline. Those guys aren't <laughs> jumping on a trampoline. It's supposed to be a mountaintop. And so this is a familiar story where Jesus takes with him Peter, James, and John. There they are laying there. Up on the leads them up to the high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. That's Jesus right there, okay? And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. But notice, check out, there's two other guys hanging out with Jesus up there. And who are those guys? And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. 2,000 plus years of redemptive history have gone by, and who are the two guys who make the cut to appear with Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses and Elijah. So Elijah is a big, big deal, and here we are passing the baton, going through a time of transition. I'm going to draw your attention to your Bibles in 2 Kings 2 now, and you really want to have a Bible open, because I'm going to read a number of verses, and I'm going to have you... Uh, kind of uh, get your radar going to look for a very specific thing in this passage. And this thing is this. Elijah, Israel's hero, is done. His ministry is over. And Elisha will take his place. I want you to look through this passage as I read it and see how much the people involved struggle and wrestle and even resist this transition. It's really tough when we lose our spiritual leaders and they're replaced by their successors. And you can see this right in the passage. Notice how hard this transition is, starting with verse 1. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha. Now, I wish it was Elijah and Bill. It'd be so much easier. And I promise you, I'm going to say Elisha when I mean Elijah and vice versa. In this sermon, it's inevitable, but you'll still just have to follow along, Okay. Elijah's the guy whose ministry is done. Elisha is his successor. And they're on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elijah said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha, the successor, and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And Elisha said, yes, I know. Keep quiet. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But Elisha says, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were there drew near to Elisha and said to him, do, do, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? It's almost like they're saying, do we have a game plan? What, 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 what's the plan now? And he answered, yes, I know. Keep quiet. Verse 6, Elijah said to him, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But Elisha said, again, as the Lord lives, you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water. And the water of the river was parted to the one side and to the other till the two of them could go over on dry ground. Verse 9, when they crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. Now notice, everybody in this narrative knows Elijah's going to be taken. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of uh, when. Okay? And Elisha said, please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, you have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I'm being taken from you, it shall be so for you, but if you don't see me, it won't be so. Verse 11, and as they went on and talked, behold, Chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elisha went up by a whirlwind into heaven. You know the old phrase, what a way to go. <laughs> Here we are. And Elisha saw it and cried, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw them, or he saw him, saw Elijah no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes, tore him in two pieces. He took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him. And went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? 
Well, the God of Elijah has now become the God of Elisha. Check it out. And when he struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. Now, when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him opposite them, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. And they said to him, behold, now there are with your servants 50 strong men. Please let them go and seek your master, Elijah. It may be that the Spirit of the Lord has caught him up and cast him up on some mountain or some valley. And Elisha says, don't even bother. You shall not send. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, send, go ahead. They sent, therefore, 50 men, and for three days they sought him but did not find him. And they came back to him while he was staying at Jericho, and he said to them, Did I not say, do not go? Boy, don't you get the sense that these people are really struggling with this transition and letting go of Elijah? Everybody in the narrative knows that it's Elijah's time to go, and everybody in the narrative knows it's of the Lord in this case because, you know, the Lord will take away the let's mention several times, and yet they remain troubled by it. In fact, Elisha, the successor, he doesn't even want to talk about it, does he? These prophets say to him, you know, you, uh, the Lord's going to take your master away. He just says, I know, shut up, you know, two times in the passage. And then three times in the passage, Elisha, he will not let go of Elijah. Three times in the passage, as the Lord lives and you yourself lives, I will not leave you. I will not leave you. Follows him to Bethel, follows him to Jericho, follows him to the Jordan. And then probably the funniest part, the very prophets at Bethel who told Elisha, do you know that your Lord's going to take your master from you? Those same prophets, after Elijah's gone, they want to send 50 dudes out to look for him. You just really sense that you know, kind of emotional reaction to this whole transition is, uh, is very, very strong and even flies in the face of the reality of what God is up to. Now, it's interesting that uh, uh, change is, is, is so, so hard for us. I mean, it's hard when we get a new boss at work. It's hard when, you know, something goes on at school or whatever. But, boy, change in health, things like that. But it over the years, something I've noticed, so 40 plus years in pastoral ministry, is change is particularly hard when it happens at church, when it happens among the people of God. And I've reflected on that as a pastor over the years, and I think there are numbers of reasons for that, but I want to share a few with you today that might uh, help as we wrestle with change, which is inevitable in any uh, living organism like uh, the Christian church. The first reason I think transitions are so troubling is because we become attached to our spiritual leaders, and in many cases, rightly so. Yes, there is a dysfunctional attachment. We have a celebrity culture where, sadly, many Christians see their pastors, whether they're TV preachers or they're preachers at their churches, as substitutes for God in their lives, and they put them on a pedestal. That's not a healthy attachment, but there is also a very healthy kind of attachment that comes with our spiritual leaders. And when they leave, it makes it really, really hard when ministries change. I became a Christian back in 1975, and the pastor at the time was this old guy. I have to laugh because he was 10 years younger than I am now or so. <laughs> but he was, uh, seemed old back then. His name was Barney Andrews, and he was the conservative Baptist pastor of the conservative Baptist church. And here I came in, hair back, come down to my back, this former druggy rock and roll musician. God got a hold of me. And this uh, old guy just received me with open arms. And, and I wasn't particularly enamored by his, his sermons and this and that, but he just, it, he was my pastor. Five years later, he performed Joanna My Wedding. Uh, he was, uh, you know, around the year my first daughter, uh, Rebecca, was born. And then a year or so later, he retired from the ministry. And that, I'll never forget that. He was my pastor. And that was a transition. That was a challenge because of that. And this is biblical. Notice the passage here. The Apostle Paul spent three years ministering in Ephesus. And boy, did people get attached to him. And so when he told them that they wouldn't see him anymore, look at the reaction. There was much weeping among them all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, grieving especially because they would not see him again. Folks, these are natural, normal emotions that 
stir up in our heart when there is transition in leadership uh, among the people of God. The second reason I think transitions are troubling for us is often our roles change. Our roles often change. When there's a change of leadership, there's a change of ministry, and there's a, often a change of role. I remember when I was uh, at my previous church, there was a period of about five years where John Hutchison, one of our pastor elders here, was the senior pastor. Uh, I was the pastor of single adult ministries, and John quit to take the job at Biola, where he works now. And there was an interim period of about a year or so searching for a new pastor, and so I was filling the pulpit every Sunday. And it was the first time I had preached in a large congregation every Sunday, and it was really fun. And it was exciting. God was using my gifts. The church was responding really positively. And so I threw my hat in the ring for the job of the pastor of the church. And I didn't get the job. They hired somebody else. And I was pretty bummed out. And uh, so what happened was here I was in a position where I was using my gifts to the max and God seemed to be blessing. And then the rug was pulled out from under me. That was taken away. And it wasn't uh, too many years, five years or so later, that I ended up here at Oceanside Christian Fellowship. But I think back to that, and that was very hard at the time. But in retrospect, it was the best thing that could have happened to me. Because had I taken that job, I would have had to quit my doctoral program at UCLA because I couldn't have done both. I never would have finished my PhD. I never would have ended up educating pastors who are all over the world, pastors and missionaries all over the world for 20 years at Talbot School of Theology. And I never would have written my book when the church was a family that's now been read by probably six, 8,000 people, and I get emails talking about how profoundly it's influenced their view of ministry and the way they are planting and leading their churches. Now, I don't say any of this to toot my horn, simply to say this, when my role changed, and I was so grieved about losing this opportunity to use my gifts the way I had, I had no idea how God would multiply my effect for the kingdom of God in ways that never would have happened if I would have stayed in that church and not gone on into higher education, training pastors and Christian leaders who are now all over the world. So we just never know. If roles change and we're willing, God will continue to use us, maybe in some ways that... Uh, uh, go far beyond the uh, ministries we tend to grasp and hold on to with our kind of smaller little view of life. The final reason I think transitions are so troubling is because the church functions for us as a symbol of our invisible God. And this is true whether you're involved in the ministry of the church or not. Folks, think about this with me, because I've reflected on this a lot. We are inundated by change. This wasn't true of traditional cultures, the early church, first century Palestine, where things stayed the same generation after generation. Folks, things are changing so radically, it's absolutely unbelievable. I was sharing with somebody the other, one day that uh, you know, I paid 1300 bucks back in uh, 1984, 1985, $1985, 1300 for a hard disk for my Macintosh. That hard disk uh, held 10 megabytes, I swear, 10 megabytes. Wouldn't even hold your pictures, not five of them but it held my thesis, okay? Well, look at now, man. You for, ten, for, you know, a grand how many terabytes, you can buy a server, you know? You can buy Google. I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, change. It's like every time I open my computer, something is changing around the world, gadgets on and on and on. What is the one thing that doesn't change in our lives? It's our unchanging God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But, folks, God's invisible. What represents God to us psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. It's Sunday. We come to church Sunday after Sunday to hopefully be reminded of the one thing that doesn't ever change, and that is God. And when there's change in the church, it just upsets the whole apple cart. Understandably so. This is probably why these traditional denominations, Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox, they've done the same liturgy, the same stuff on Sunday for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years because that reflects the stability, the sameness of God. So it's understandable. What these guys are experiencing here in 2 Kings 2, what we experience during times of transition in our churches, 
Totally understandable for so many reasons. I mean, think about Oceanside Christian Fellowship, what you and I have gone through in the last several years. We lost Michael Martin, one of our pastors. We've hired Chris full-time. We've hired Carlos full-time. Brandon, who was full-time for 20 years and did half to, mo to more of the preaching, left and went half-time as of last fall. He's full-time out of Biola University now. You might not even have known that because we decided we wanted to use his half-time in the way that, that, that creates the least change for you. And since the most people are here on, on Sundays, he's staying in the preaching rotation about the same number of sermons a year, and the changes are made behind the scene and other areas of leadership. So now we're going through a transition in worship with uh, uh, a new worship leader starting in the office this month. And so, you know, how do we wrestle with all this? Well, our passage, I think, gives us some really encouraging guidelines. And as you look at the text, the first thing you'll notice is that God's work is not limited to our particular person or our particular time in history. God's work is not limited to our particular person or particular time in history. Isn't it interesting that both Elijah and Elisha smack the Jordan River with their cloaks and the river Jordan River parts and they walk across on dry ground? Does that ring a bell of a previous story in the Bible? Remember when Joshua and the Israelites came into the promised land and Joshua parted the Jordan and they crossed on dry ground? Here they are, hundreds of years later, and you can imagine, man, those were the glory days. Man, God was just, God was really involved in our lives. Look what's going on now. The whole nation's gone to Baal worship. Hardly anybody worships God. Times are tough, man. Look, at they're going to, you know, they're going to they're gonna outlaw Christianity. Pretty soon we're going to be uh, persecuted, and churches won't have a tax write-off, and all this kind of stuff's happening in our culture. Where is God? The message is, look, the God who parted the Jordan in 1400 B.C. is the God who parted the Jordan in 850 B.C., who is the God who dwells among us today, folks. And the same is true for particular persons. Here's some good news. Boy, this had to be good news to these folks here in our passage. It says, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. Is Elijah irreplaceable? No. The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And actually, it's not the spirit of Elijah at all, is it? It's the spirit of the living God. Some of you have been here long enough to remember when we lost our founding pastor, Duke Windsor. And that was tough. It was tougher for some of us than for others. There was a guy who came up to us as a leadership team at that time and says, we can't lose Duke. Oceanside Christian Fellowship is the church of Duke like the Lutheran church is the church of Luther. Well, we did lose Duke, and Brandon took his place, and we hit a few speed bumps, but we just kept on keeping on, and God blessed the ministry of OCF over the years. God's work's not limited to a particular person or a time in history. In fact, this comes out even in the literary structure of the passage. I don't usually do this kind of stuff, but on your outlines, a little, some kind of indentation, little diagram thing there. And you'll notice Elijah travels in the first part of the chapter from Bethel to Jericho to the Jordan. Elisha travels, retracing Elijah's steps from the Jordan to Jericho to Bethel. It's as if the writer under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is saying everything is okay. Like Elijah so is Elisha. And uh, for those of you who are more visual learners, here's a map. We'll blow up the little middle portion here. And you can see here's the beginning of the chapter. Elijah goes Bethel, Jericho, across the Jordan River there. And second half of the chapter, Elisha goes Jordan River, Jericho, back to Bethel. The, uh, this replacement stuff, uh, this transition stuff, the... Uh, continuity of God in the midst of leadership transition is even woven into the literary structure of the text. I'm going to move ahead a little bit and uh, take us to the, uh, the, 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 the second point on your outline here. Uh, how do we know God is still in control? How do we know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever in the face of transition? Well, uh, how we know is God continues to do what only God does. And what God does as he interacts with human beings 
is God both extends his grace and love to those who are willing to receive it and judges those who are not. That is the message of Scripture from the beginning to the end. So first thing that we see God doing throughout the Scriptures is God will continue to reverse the curse. This is what God does. And when we see him do it again and again and again, we're reminded that God stays the same no matter who or when. And here's a little uh, uh, something that might help some of you who, you know, don't get this Christianity stuff. And, the, you know, the Bible's kind of a big complex book, but you can really boil down the story of Scripture into something as simple as this. The story of the Bible is God fixing the mess we've made of the life He's given us because we can't fix it ourselves. Now, God has done that in history at the individual level by sending His Son Jesus to die for our sins and restore our relationship with God. We can't fix that ourselves. God is going to do it at the end of history when Jesus returns and all of creation is restored and the whole universe is put back in order and the whole mess is finally fixed once and for all. But folks, along the way in the narrative of Scripture, there are these cool little incidents where God kind of blows into our reality and reminds us that he is in the business of reversing the curse and fixing the mess. And this next story on your outline, our next story, uh, yeah, the passages on your outline in our passage shows this in living color. Notice what happens. It says, Now the men of the city of Jericho said to Elisha, Behold, the situation of this city is pleasant as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the land is unfruitful. Bring me a new bowl and put salt in it, Elijah said. So they brought it to him, or Elisha. They brought it to him, and then he went to the spring of water, threw the salt in it, and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. So the water has been healed to this day according to the word that Elijah, uh, Elisha spoke. Now, uh, I'm going to take you back and see how significant this is in biblical history. And remember, Jericho is a pretty important place. Remember when the Israelites came into the promised land back about 1400 B.C. or so, it was at Jericho, it was the first Canaanite resistance, rebellion against what God was up to, and the walls came tumbling down, and Jericho was destroyed, and Jericho became the, uh, uh, a, kind of a symbol at that time, geographically, of the curse of everything bad about the mess we've made of the life God's given us. And Joshua laid an oath on the people of Israel at the time, saying, Cursed before the Lord is the man who rises up and rebuilds this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn, he shall lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest son, he shall set up his gates. Let nobody rebuild this place, or bad stuff's going to happen. Well, a few hundred years later, along came a contractor who saw the site, thought it was a pretty uh, nice spot, you know, location, 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 and rebuilt Jericho. And look what happened to his family. In Ahab's days, Heel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of Abiram, his firstborn, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. And what happens in our passage is God busts in and gives us a little picture on how his grace and mercy works and how he reverses the curse when we see here it says, Elijah went to the spring of water, threw salt in it, and it says, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it, so the water has been healed to this day, according to the word that Elisha spoke. doesn't matter who's leading Israel. doesn't matter who the prophet is, Elijah, Elisha, whoever. God is still in the business of reversing the curse, of blowing in with his mercy and grace and taking what we have made a mess of and fixing it and restoring it to His glory. Many of you have seen this happen in your own lives as you look back at issues of your lives where you made some serious sinful mistakes and God has taken those, uh, that sin and redeemed it uh, and, done a, and, and reversed the curse in your life. Finally, we know that God is still in control, not just because God exercises grace and mercy, but because God also exercises judgment and justice. God will not only continue to reverse the curse, no matter who is leading and no matter when it is in salvation history, God will continue to curse the perverse. 
Now, this brings us to a bizarre passage. That's all I can say. And so I'm going to read it, and you follow along, and you'll see how bizarre it is. And it's really, once we understand it, it's not that bizarre at all. It's very, very troubling and challenging, but it's not bizarre. Check this out. What a story. So Elisha went on up there to Bethel. While he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him and said, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. And he turned around, and when he saw them, check this out, he cursed them, cursing the perverse, in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. What? From there, he went on to Mount Carmel, and from there, he returned to Samaria. The story of the Bible just keeps going as if nothing strange has been said, <laughs> you know? And, you know, these, these you know, pinhead Bible scholars, they say, oh, that story was obviously inserted after the fact. It's a little legend, this and that. But, no, we've already seen that this whole chapter is mapped out with a very, uh, a very intentional literary organization, you know. Uh, uh, Bethel, Jericho, Jordan, Jordan, Jericho, Bethel. This is no accident that this is in here. And so we have to kind of sort this out. So please bear with me as we try to unpack this, all right? That was for the mothers in our midst, Mother's Day, you know? Okay. This is not, folks, a childish stunt. It looks like it, but it's not. And there's a reason for that. These small boys were probably teenagers at least, maybe even uh, uh, a little bit older, maybe even 20 years old, certainly uh, older teens. And that's important to have in mind. And there was a mob of them. Just 42 got trashed. Imagine how many of them there were. So first of all, there's that to consider. Secondly, the location of the incident is crucial. Folks, this happens at Bethel. And Bethel, when the nation of Israel divided into two, Israel and Judah, Bethel was the place where Jeroboam set up the golden calf, the bull, so that Israel wouldn't go to Jerusalem and worship Yahweh where God intended. It was the first move away from Yahweh toward an idolatry that would result in the kind of rank Baal worship that we've learned about the last few weeks together. So these, peop these, these young people who are coming out of Bethel probably have no love for Yahweh and no love for Yahweh's prophet. Okay? The third thing is the intentionality of the offense. The intentionality of the offense. Okay, uh, you read this and you sort of get the impression that maybe, you know, Elisha's just kind of ambling through town and he happens to walk by the local skate park and these <laughs> kids look at him and they go, hey, you bald head, knucklehead, look at that dude, you know. That ain't what happens at all. These kids, uh, Elisha's walking along a road outside of town. These kids have to leave. These young men have to leave the walled city and intentionally go out. To, uh, to rag on Elisha. So there, this is a, an intentional act. Finally, uh, look at the content of the mockery. It's very interesting. As a matter of fact, Elisha's head would have been covered as he traveled. So these young men, this is no act. They already know he's bald. They're intentionally going out of the city. And then they say this, uh, uh, go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald. What's that all about? Well, it can mean one of two things. It could mean that they're kind of mocking him and telling him, let's see you pull an Elijah. Go up like Elijah did. Go up, dude. Ascend to heaven. Where are the chariots? Go up. More likely, it means what the New International Version thought it meant when they translated it like this. Get out of here, Baldy. Get out of here, Baldy. The New Living Translation says the same thing. They're basically saying, you're, he's walking by, you just keep walking. We don't want anything to do with you. And so you put all this together, and you conclude with Dale Davis that these are responsible young lads expressing abuse, contempt, and hostility toward Yahweh's representative, and they knew they were doing so. And that, folks, is serious stuff. In fact, those bears uh, that we chuckle about are not just any bears. They're what this commentator calls covenant bears. And here's what he means. Look at the warning back in the Old Testament for those who would rebel against God. Leviticus 26, if you continue hostile to me and will not obey me, God says, I will let loose wild animals against you and they shall bereave you of your children and destroy your livestock. This is his promise coming true, folks. The same passages in the Old Testament say, if you will obey me, I will bless your socks off, and you'll experience life like you never imagined it. But if you disobey me, 
Some bad stuff's going to happen, and we see it happening right in our passage. Now, uh, in our culture, we read passages like this, and we kind of chuckle. We, we take God so lightly. We're all about God's grace and God's love. But when it comes to God's judgment, and again, God's the same yesterday, day, and forever. He will uh, uh, reverse the curse, but he will continue to curse the perverse. When it comes to God's judgment, we struggle. Earlier commentators didn't struggle. They had room in their theology for the whole picture of both a loving and a holy, just God. Look what Matthew Henry writes about this incident. It's very sobering. He says, let the hideous shrieks and groans of this wicked, wretched brood make our flesh tremble before God. Let me just let that one sit for a minute. So here we are 2,000 years later, and God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as OCF goes through leadership transition, and as every church you're ever a part of will continue to go through leadership transition, God will remain the same yesterday, today, and forever and continue to curse the perverse and reverse the curse. And this is where we're at right now in salvation history. Who are the perverse? Well, the perverse are every one of us who are born into this sinful world and who have a sin nature and who sin against the holy standards of God, and, and here's the key part, who think that we can fix the mess we've made by ourselves, who think we do not need Jesus, we do not need God's grace and God's help to fix the mess we've made of the life God's given us. And what does the Bible say about that? For all who rely on works of the law, trying to make ourselves right before God, are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it's evident that no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. So God is still in the business of cursing the perverse. And God is still in the business. Here's the good news, folks, of reversing the curse. Notice how our passage goes on. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. What this is saying is we can't fix the mess we've made of the life God's given us. But what happened is God has fixed it and is in the process of fixing it to the nth degree. He sent his son Jesus who stood in our place and took God's judgment for sin so that we might be forgiven, received into fellowship with God and one another, be filled with his spirit and enjoy the life that God has intended for us. So folks, when you get a new boss, when you have health issues, when there's leadership change at your church, be assured God remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. God continues to reverse the curse. God continues his wonderful story of fixing the mess we've made of the life he's given us. And folks, someday he's going to fix it completely and wipe every tear from our eyes. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your 